Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vinnie Brusco Show. And here we go. So I, don't, I don't know what kind of... I don't know what kind of sick joke is going on, but all they had in the fridge was old Milwaukee, and I don't know who the hell would buy old Milwaukee. Just drink it. I mean, I, I found I found a a holiday Budweiser. Okay, you need, you need like a pipe. You need to have like a pipe right now, like sitting back. I just have a pipe on the boat. <laughs> do you still have the boat? I do. It's in L.A. It's in L.A. Yeah, That's sweet, man. I'm your um. I'm here for like just a couple of weeks here on the East Coast. LA got LA's getting a little too much for me, so I had to I had to come home the East Coast, see some snow, be with my family. Yeah, cheers, man. Cheers. What are you drinking? Uh, it's a local brewery called Diner Brew. Uh, this is their vote for Pedro. They came by, dropped off of a that. few six packs. So I heard that. Where are you? Where are you based out of? Uh, Westchester, New York. Oh, like Westchester, New York. Nice. Yeah, I always felt like I was in, uh, like born on the wrong coast, uh, yeah. and I always wanted like I have a like a kind of a shorts and flip flops mentality. How does that translate into like you're from Philly? Sure. How did that translate into going kind of out west? Uh well, dude, I, honestly, going the flip flops, I always wore flip flops. Like always. Like, growing, so growing up, I'm from just outside of Philly, and always barefoot running around. We had a cabin in um in the middle of pennsylvania near penn state if people are familiar with that but there's a river that goes to it's called the susquehanna or the there's the susquehanna river comes from cooperstown new york where the baseball hall of fame is goes down through pennsylvania into uh the chesapeake bay where baltimore and bc are and then there's this little river called the junietta river and i used to bass fish there all the time and so i was always barefoot and always wearing flip-flops and when i was in philly the girls i went to temple university my name was flip-flop boy because it would literally be in the middle of winter. And I wanted to go to USC so bad. But I was the oldest of nine kids. My mom was like, no. Nah. Nine? Yeah, my mom was like, stay here. So, like, I had that, that LA mentality or that California mentality, too, that I just, if, if I dress the part, maybe it will feel authentic. Yeah. But I was the only kid just rocking flip-flops in, in Philly. Actually, it was the NFC Championship game when the Eagles beat um, 2004 or 2005 when the Eagles. Hold on, you're 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 robotic again. Am I robotic again? Yeah. Still. Yeah. So what? What? I don't understand. It could be my end. I have like a, I have a whole new setup here. You're gonna be the first podcast that's actually gonna be video format. Usually I do this all via phone. I like I like the video format. You like the video format? Yeah, dude. I'm, I, uh, I, I'm a radio guy, so I just, I don't mind. I think there's like the lag and then there's just too much technology. I get like a good old fashioned phone call. I think you get more essence out of a phone call than you can in, even in a video conference. I agree, but I feel like right now with social and how everything is, people want to see that like the, you know, everybody loves the video. Yeah, you have to. I mean, that, and that's kind of the conversion. So this is going to be out in January um, cool. and this will be the first episode of the podcast actually being in a video format. So, yeah, but I was the same way. Like I went to, I was born and raised in the Bronx. Right. And I went to school in Albany and people are like, Oh, you're from, you're from the Bronx. I'm like, yeah. Like you like Dave Matthews band. You're wearing flip-flops. Like there's no way you're from the Bronx. I was like, like you're from Long Island. I'm like, I'm not from Long Island. I'm from the fucking Bronx. <laughs> well, it's funny. Cause I wanted to go to Syracuse. Yeah. Um, I want to go to Syracuse and I saw the snow and I was like, no, nah, but so what I was saying, the NFC Championship game when Eagles beat uh, the Falcons. And I remember we had like a foot of snow and I'm wearing flip-flops and we're like running from like Broad Street down to like City Hall. And I blew out my flip-flop and I was like barefoot. And I'm like, you know what? I feel like this is, this is like the savage Philly. Broken glass everywhere. This is, this is my roots. I can't excuse it. <laughs> this is who and fun. what I am. This is who and what I am. So how did you, how did you get into – you are born Philly, went out to California. How did you make that transition, and, and how did you kind of get into the work you're doing now? Because you were in, like, broadcasting and television and, and kind of doing the thing there. Yeah, I, I, went to, uh, I went to school for broadcast journalism, so I was in Philly. Philly sports, like, the dream, reporting on everything. Our college, like, we have big five basketball. Like, we have, it was awesome. Sports was like a dream, and I kind of, you know, I just – 
I got to a point where, I don't know, I, I just saw guys like my age that were athletes that were like total assholes to like reporters that were reporters for like ever. So they'd be like this legendary Philly reporter and you see some new kid in, blow them off or just like, I just saw the mentality and I just saw the reporters were and I was just like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to hype somebody up that they're this amazing person when the guy's an asshole. So I got into, um, I got, I was hosting and then I got in the film and, and I was doing a lot of acting and I was producing movies and um, I, well, I always wanted to go in California once I wanted to go to college there and I kept saying I was going to go, kept saying I was going to go and I hit like 30 and I didn't go yet. And I was working on a show in New York and I, I noticed that everybody was getting the big roles would be from here. They would go out West, they would book to something and then they would come back. So I was like, well, I got to just do that. And I was looking for a, a time to pull the trigger. I did this, e this road trip cross country with my little brother because he moved to SF. And um, I got back and I told my girls like, yo, like, let's, let's make this like legit. And I want to move to California. Let's do all this stuff. And she's like, cool, you can move to California. I'm going to break up. You're so, robotic. You're robotic again. But I got that you, you, you told your girl that you were like, let's move to Cali. Yeah, so so that literally I, I just threw ah, you're still you're still robotic. Dude, this is this is a great way to, to introduce the video. Just 2020 is not over yet. I, listen, I, I it is not. now you sound great. You go okay. it goes back and forth. It's in and out, whatever. It is what it is. Um so but, but I drove out I drove out west and I was just like drove out there and I just, whatever, the, the classic story, whatever was in my car, I, I just threw in and then I got out there and I'm like, well, shit, here I am. Now what? Well, there's something very romantic about that, right? Like my wife and I, like I joke around all, I joke around all the time, but I'm like, let's just sell fucking everything. We have two kids. My daughter's five and my son's one and a half. I'm like, let's just fucking sell everything. Get a fucking Winnebago, get a van. And let's just like, what are we, what are, what are we holding on to? Our families are very close which, and we're very close to our families. Don't get me wrong. But it's like, what are we like, why are we have such resistance to take that leap of faith in ourselves? And it's different, obviously with, with the kids and stuff like that. It's not as easy as when you're a bit younger and, and you're just like, fuck it, I'm going to go for it. But what, what, there had to be something kind of inside of you. I imagine that like, you were just like, the essence of you who's just like, yeah, I got to, I got to do this. What was that internal dialogue like? Cause so many people get that awareness, right? Yeah. But it's another thing to step into action. Well, I think, well, one, you could definitely do that. I have a bunch of friends. <laughs> one of them is our van quest on Instagram. They're awesome. They're family. They convert like school buses and, and their stuff's awesome, but, but take a look at them on Instagram. So you could definitely do it. Cause I, that's like the move right now. Uh, family's just hitting the road, but you know what it was? Honestly, I, I, my, I did this like leadership thing or something like in fifth grade or whatever it was, where we went out to California for like two weeks as a kid. And we went and we explored like Yosemite and we were in the Redwoods and we went out to, on the other side of San Francisco, it's like a bay, obviously San Francisco Bay, but we did this marine biology thing. And I remember coming home and not being able to describe to like kids in fifth or sixth grade what I saw over the summer. Like, they're like, wow. oh, what did you do over the summer? And I couldn't explain that 25 kids all held hands around a sequoia and we couldn't hit the other side. And I couldn't explain these waterfalls. And like, no one believed what I was saying. It was like I was in this, this fairy world. You're in Narnia. Fairy world. And that was just always in me. And I started reading more John Muir and just like this, I was like, dude, I need to be out in that wilderness. So for me, it wasn't necessarily like LA for work, yes, but it's, it was the beauty of California that like you could get in your car and do this epic road trip and it's only a couple hours from where you live. So it was that romance of just like that untamed wilderness and just the vastness of, of just like adventure for me. Well, yeah, there's, there's definitely something I think in our DNA that connects us you know, to the earth, whatever you want to, whatever rabbit hole you want to go down. But like, I, I kind of told the story a couple of times before, but I went on a hike with my family and there was a tree and I was just like, I want to fucking hug this tree. And I just hugged the tree and I, it was just like so welcoming and yeah. so like fur, it just felt like I was being hugged back. And I told my daughter, I was like, come on, hug the tree. And she like comes over, she hugs the tree. And it was like, there was something to that. And I'm sure like, you know, you're from Philly, you go to California and now you have a gamut 
of of you have the mountains, you have the beach, you have you have the wilderness. Like you have a. Well, you're gamut. from the Bronx. We're not going. We're not going around hugging skyscrapers. You know what I mean? I'm not <laughs> hugging. I, I, we're, we're not doing that. We're, it's a disconnect, right? Like you you don't have that connection with like nature and the earth, and it's like the moment. And that sounds weird, but even like tonight, it's when Jupiter and Saturn are aligning. Yeah. And like, you know, in the city, you can't see shit. Yeah. But if I was in California, I could literally get in the car in an hour and a half. I'll be in Joshua Tree on top of a mountain and you can see the Milky Way. That's wild. And like here, people are like, what is that? Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is like, so I, I set up in the pod shed here. And I'll give you a little. Uh, yeah, let me see that a little bit. A little pod shed tour here. So this is the. See. There's a little bit of a wider view here. Um, but um, so it's like, you know, it's my little, it's my little pod chin. And I did it early in, in quarantine and I kind of wanted to force it. But one of my favorite things to do is like doing a podcast late at night or having a, a coaching client late at night. And then when I'm done, I just step outside into my backyard and I just look up and it's, you know, I live in, in Westchester. So I live 20 minutes outside the city, but you look up and it's just like, oh yeah, the vastness of it all kind of comes into play. And you're kind of reminded that like, Oh yeah, like I'm just this small little blade of grass in this large backyard. Yeah, we it's it, you know it's the, I, I like that. It's funny that you said it because um, I I I'm on the East Coast. I'm right outside Philly, and and I left the other day from LA, and I was so caught up in just like LA's on full lockdown again, and you know you're, it's illegal to sing. Just put it that <laughs> right, way. Right, so right. I get on this plane, and I just have a million things on my head, and we like take off and like as we're going up i'm like looking at la and i'm like this is like top 15 biggest city in the world it doesn't look that big from up here i can see catalina island and then i could see like i could see like the mountains and i could see the joshua tree and i could see the mojave desert and i was like i'm so caught up and like what's going on because like one governor one man is telling us what to do here but like ten thousand feet up who gives a shit about that guy? About, like, look, at the, look at all this beauty, you know? And it was, it's funny that you said that just like, you know, like a blade of grass. Cause like when, when I was able to go out, I was like, oh, this is the beauty of, of being able to like, if you meditate or you pray, being able to slow down and be able to just like step out of that and step out of like all that bullshit that we get caught up in. And um, I think in cities, it's a lot easier to do that right now than it is um, you know, if, if you're in rural areas. So that, that was like, a, it was like an awesome kind of thing where I just slowed down and I just said a prayer as I was like flying around, flying above. And like the whole flight was incredible. Like we flew over the desert, we flew over the Grand Canyon, we flew over the Rocky Mountains, we saw, like clear as day, the Mississippi. And like, it was the most beautiful five hour tour across America and everybody's sleeping on the plane but me. I was reading 1984. Oh, perfect and, book to uh, be reading right now. <laughs> yeah, 1984. Very appropriate. And I was like looking out. I'm like, man, this is, you get so caught up up here that I forget to look and see what's all around. Yeah, that's, or that's, anymore. it's so easy, especially in times like this. You know, I'm so grateful that, you know, I have a pretty diligent meditation practice. I've, I have a lot of things that I do, you know, it, inside my own psych in my own world and I, and I really try to be as diligent with that as possible because i know the importance of it and it, it's it's proven to be very important to me throughout throughout especially this time because if, if you get caught up in, in in the you get caught in the the momentum of like just being in a city or, or the momentum of a culture you can get completely unwound and, and lose yourself completely and just go completely sideways I heard, I was listening to a podcast today and, and this uh, doctor was on and she was talking about how dangerous the media is for like our health, like getting mm -hmm. caught up in the, in the fear and then everything that spirals and then we start creating things and then we start creating these disconnects and then we start putting ourselves in these buttons. It's like we spiral out of control and you can't stop. And she, I, unless I heard her wrong, I think she said we're all addicted to this fear porn. Fear of porn is like it's a nonstop. I think that's what she said. I that's how I heard it. Fear of okay. porn. All right, let's like, go. Like, fear of porn. To like, this, like, oh man, here's the next thing that I can like and get riled up over. And yeah. I was like, man, like, but uh, to, to kind of go back to nature, I did this permaculture course. I've been really trying to get back to nature and I've been really trying to like find somewhere that's off grid. And I did this permaculture course out in California, middle of nowhere. And for like two weeks, I had no very limited service 
and every night was the Milky Way. It was these awesome gardens and like working with the soil and like working with like these 25 people and everybody's just like, we're picking our food and eating it. And we're like with chickens wow. and just like, it was so awesome, but just like no stress. It was no stress. I didn't have to like look at my phone. I just left my phone. I was like middle of the night, I'll go work and I'll worry about stuff then. But like during the day, it was just, it, dude, it was so incredible to like feel like feel human again. Yeah. Like this isn't an attachment and this, this tells me what to think or what to do. And like, I didn't even, I meditated every day, but we didn't use an app. It was a bunch of people sat and meditated together. You know, it was a bunch of people that did yoga in the morning together. And it was just like reconnecting with like that. And, and I think I showered like four times for like two weeks and it was this outdoor shower yeah. that like overlooked the mountains and it dude, just like feeling dirty and just like, my beard got all, all out of control and it felt so good to not care, to not care what other people think, to not care about that perception. And we're just like, I didn't even see a mirror. I didn't even see a, my, my reflection for two weeks. It was awesome. Yeah. Well, you, you, you get caught up, like I said, you get caught up in, in the momentum and the inertia of, of what other people are doing with, you know, the great quote comparison is the thief of joy. And you get caught yeah. up on you get caught up on that train, and you get caught up in in the Instagram. And you said, you know, what to think and what and and you know, it also tells you how to feel, which is the crazier part because you start to dictate your feelings towards people, towards things, towards yourself based off of your experiences with this. And this isn't this isn't life. That's not real life. But we've invested and put so much, and 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 the companies have put so much research and development behind that to make that life that we lose ourselves in that. And it's so hard to disconnect from that. And, if, and, and you know, especially during this time when people are isolated, man, it's, it's, it's very scary. Dude, it's, it's terrifying, you know? Um, it, it is. I, I have so many buddies. Just, just put it this way. I have a, I have a cousin that I... Hold on, you're, a, you're robotic again. I'm robotic? Yeah. I'm robotic. It's I still, like it. I, I, think it's, I think it's either the aliens or, or the government breaking into the... Well, we're using Zoom. We're using yeah, Zoom. <laughs> that's true. I don't have a password on this either. Yeah, so. What are they, what are they saying? Um, no, but 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 it's so true, dude. Like I, I run a, a couple, like I run a men's group, and in the morning, in one of my men's groups, I had a buddy come on, and I've been telling this buddy to come on this men's group for forever, and and um, he just he was just like, nah, bro, I'm good. Like I don't know what kind of shit you're doing. I'm cool with that. Yeah. And and uh, it's funny because. Uh, over at Movember, you guys know Movember. Uh, sure, of course. They ran a study early. I think it was like towards July. And I think it was like 80% of men had no one reach out to them and see how they were doing. And that, and that, and then all the studies went off of that percentage went off that made them dictate whether or not they felt like they were worth something wow. and whether or not they felt people cared. And it turned out those same men were afraid to reach out because they didn't want to seem like weak or they, they were afraid that if they asked for something, they wouldn't know how to like handle if somebody wanted something. There's this big, this culture that men are afraid to ask for help or that men are afraid to like, be like, Hey, like I want to talk. So I ran, I, I uh, run this group called truth tellers and, and we meet Tuesday mornings. We do a no bullshit coffee conversation. Yeah. 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 I had a buddy jump on and he's very hesitant. He's just like this. Actually, this happened to my cousin too. My cousin came on it and they're both just like this. And my cousin just starts crying. Wow. And he doesn't do it. And my buddy just started crying. And I'd seen this, I haven't seen this buddy in a couple of years. And he just, he's like, everybody just stopped. And just like sat. And he's like, you know, my dad died. My dad just recently died. Like I had all this shit. And like, I didn't talk to anybody. I just, I, I, I was isolated. I was alone and I didn't have anything. And guys just started one by one saying how they were feeling the same way and how they were feeling depressed. And even if they were married or with somebody or whether they weren't with anybody, it was just still the same feeling. Like just cause you're with somebody doesn't mean that you're not feeling alone. Of course. And um, it was just this overall sentiment that, that just men don't communicate and men don't talk and men are afraid to ask for help. Um, and dude, it was, it was like a sobering moment to be like, oh yeah, we run a men's group. This is cool to be like, oh, this shit just got real, real quick. 
I, I also facilitate a men's group here in Westchester and you know, the first time I did it, I, I was such as hes- so hesitant to do it. I'm trying to work on this two camera thing. Uh, see how it goes. Thank, thank you, man. Um, you sound like an alien. You're, you're bouncing back and forth between lenses. I love it. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, but I was, I was facilitating the men's group and it's amazing. And I agree with you, man. It's amazing how guys are hesitant to step into that space and hesitant mm-hmm. to lean into that type of atmosphere. But once Pandora's box is open and they feel like they're in a space where they're not being judged based on how masculine they are. They're not being judged. They're not being looked at in a way that's going to be, you know, insulting or demoralizing, but they could come and and be, and and have space held for them and be seen in a way that maybe they've never been seen their entire lives. And they start to unpack some things. Mm -hmm. It's, It's really, it becomes very powerful. I, you know, I, how long have you been running your group? So it will be a year in March, I think, nice. about that. That's awesome. Um, I, I think for, I think for me, I, I've been part of men's groups and running men's groups for a couple of years now, but I think this year more than ever, particularly truth tellers, this group, because the guys are so diverse and they're from all, like we have guys from California, from Kentucky, from Philly, from from Florida, from Chicago, they're all over the place. And it's very diverse. Like you, it, it's, it's like super diverse mix of dudes. And we were all talking about something and, and it ne- politics never comes up. Social shit never comes up. It's always just like, yo man, I'm coming on and we always do like a check-in. And I know you've had Mike Sagoon on and mm-hmm. Joe Holly and, and, and they, and Mike and I did every man together. We actually like trained every man together and and Joe did uh, one of our, our weekend retreats. But one of the things that we do, and I don't know if you guys do, but you, like you check in and you check in like how you're feeling emotionally. And you're like, man, you know, like emotionally I'm feeling whatever it is, like sadness or joy or fear sure. or shame, whatever. And um, it's awesome seeing all these guys just quick drop it in and new guys come in and they're hesitant. And then you just see like this big burly dude be like, yo, um, checking in, feeling sad. <laughs> I feel it like right here, like, man, I just want to cry. And people are like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just all of a sudden you see that masculine dude open up and it just sets the tone for everybody. And it's cool too, I think, with this year, but not cool. It's like it's so impactful because our group is so mixed. So, like, when I'm in LA, my thing is like, oh, you're a white, straight Christian male, shut your mouth. Yeah, right. And on these calls, it's like, Dude, we have black dudes, Hispanic dudes, Asian dudes jump on, you know, like white guys. Like it, we're from all over and everybody's experience is different because we're all from different parts of the country. And we're all having these conversations about what it means to be a man and how we move through the world as a man. And it's like, as a man, not that like, oh, I see you as this, this. It's like, no, no, no. We're all men. And this is our experience as men. And it's so cool. I think that one time our group's an hour and we're like two and a half hours in. And we're still talking. And I'm like, yo, it's like 1030. I got like clients waiting for me. And the one, the one guy's like, dude, like, look at the conversations that we're not supposed to be having. Because we look like this, not even as men, because you look like this. And I look like this, that we're supposedly not supposed to be having. And look at like the he- we like, look at like this, sh- the bonding and the healing and like how awesome this is, that it's not this like, this thing where we watch why why we should hate each other and why we shouldn't trust each other but like being on here and we're just all talking and it's like you know everybody was talking about how we all want to go up grid and then no matter where everybody was like yeah let's just look, look. we need to figure out how we can all get cabins get out just like fly fish all day hunt stuff and what and it was just like this awesome conversation that i'm like dude this this is what humans are about this yeah. connection, I hate the term social distance, physical distance. Okay. But this socially stay away. People are the enemy. It's like this thing that we're constructing. It's like, I, I even start having fear about myself. Like, Oh, do I have it? Am I going to kill somebody if I breathe on? So like, what, like I'm so it's this fear and this shit that's just running through us instead of having these conversations. It's we're, we're it got that fight flight or freeze. Yeah. So, and we're just sitting in these things and people don't know what to do because we're not having conversations and, you know, mixed on top of all this other stuff, the election, all these other things, it's just like, how much can we split everybody? 
And how much can I let you know you're so different from me that we could never have a conversation? Yeah. Until you actually sit down and have one over yeah. here. And, and you realize you want to go off the grid and so does the other person. <laughs> <Here and pop. laughs> it's, it's funny because um, with, with the men's group stuff, it, 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 it does – it does always seem to start at a certain frequency. And then once everyone kind of settles into the space and we do a little bit of like opening breath work and then we check in and stuff like that. And once, and then once that kind of gets done, everyone's shoulders are relaxed and everyone's in a kind of a different vibrational state. And it's amazing how so many times like people will reach out to me afterwards, and be like, you don't know, like that meeting, the serendipities, right? Like the coincidences of life, but you don't know how like the timing of that meeting was so pertinent in my life or like thank you so you know what i mean like and that's the stuff like it's that human connection and that realization that we're not alone that we're not all we're all going through the same shit and when you could recognize yourself just as somebody else and you could see that the problem they're going through is is something that you know you might have gone through or you could understand and 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 empathize with that they were going through it uh it becomes a totally different connection how did you get into to the men's group stuff well, first of all, I want to say we're, we're all human beings, right? Like I feel, you feel. And if you close your eyes and have a conversation, I don't know any. Right. I don't know anything. About, like it's, you close your eyes and it all shifts. Everything shifts. It's like, oh, now I'm having a conversation. I don't know anything about you. I'm, I can't look and see what you look like and make these judgments and then blah, blah, blah. It just, we, we're just humans talking. Right. Um, but I got into men's work. Um, hmm. I've always been very blessed. A lot of, a lot of guys that I see um, had a disconnect with like their fathers, whether their father wasn't there or um, they, it was like, what it means to be a man. They, sure. you know, they were hard and it taught, you know, it was always like pushing them to whatever. I was very blessed that I didn't have that. Um, my parents were amazing and like whatever things went on with their fathers or whatever, they made sure like we were never in that container. So we had an incredible childhood and parents were very open, very, uh, very emotional. Always were like, Hey, I love you. Like, it doesn't matter. Like if, if you didn't do well in sports, which I kind of hated, I was like, no, like I struck out there in the game. I'm doing some shit. Uh, but I was very blessed in that sense. So I always kind of felt like I had that emotional capacity, but I didn't know how to get deeper. And I had, a my, my previous partner, she was good friend her one of her best friends married uh this guy dan doty and dan doty was just starting up this this men's network called every man um so they were having like one of their earlier retreats out in joshua tree and i just got to la not too long before that so i went out and spent a weekend with these guys and um it was this wide array of guys from like 20 to like 60s there was celebrities in there. There was some athletes in there. And it was like, none of that shit. Like you came in and everybody has these judgments of like, you know, everybody's kind of man eyeing each other up and, and sure. you know, you're doing your thing or like guys kind of like backing down, can't make eye contact. And it was like all these like preconceived ideas that we had because of shit that we're holding in. So it's like, well, it, it was like this, it was super fucking awkward. Just put it that way. You get yeah, in yeah. and you're like, what, what are we doing? Like what? What kind of shit is this? Now, how early on in Every Man was this? Uh, I mean, this was end of 2017 or early 2018. And I think they started at late 2017. So maybe like a couple months in. Okay. So like it's not, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the presence culturally yet that it has now. No, they didn't have any. They didn't, yeah, they didn't have anything yet. And it was such a powerful weekend of just seeing guys open up and create this space to like take you there. So like, oh, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right. No, how the fuck are you feeling? Well, you know, I'm all right. Cause I'm just like, uh, can you slow down? Like you can't even look at me when you're talking right now. Yeah. Like, slow down, just breathe. Don't even say anything. And then you see a guy just sit and then boom, just open up. Yeah. Some guys you could just see this anger and this rage and you're just like, what the fuck is going on in there? And like, how are we going to help that guy get that shit out? And then by default, like, I'm like, I'm good. Like, I don't have any dad. Like, I didn't have dad issues. I didn't have anything. But, like, just seeing guys open up, like, subconsciously, you just start, things started coming up. I didn't even know that we're there. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, I didn't even know that I was feeling that. But I guess, yeah, I guess I was suppressing that. 
And it's, it was somewhere in there, but I didn't know. And it, I saw that and I was just like, man, what a powerful weekend. And I just saw like, I just saw this human connection that was like so disconnected, especially for me being in LA, working in entertainment where everything was like a me, me, me. And it was like, I'm auditioning against you. And it was so much rejection. And it was just so much shit that like, you're not really creating real bonds and like real friendships. And to see guys really drop in and, and for one to see how many guys are feeling that and are living life that way. And then to see how quickly guys opened up and the, just like the power of the work of connecting, you know, the body and like mentally, like what we're going through was like super powerful. Owen, Owen Marcus is like the guy that created everything behind every man. He's like, we call him Yoda, but he's like this genius of being able to like get the head in the heart, like get these two working together. Um, and it was beautiful. And then from there, we started, uh, we started an Everyman group in Hollywood and we met up for, uh, I stopped going, like I left the group earlier this year, but for a good almost three years or two and a half years, I was in that group. So um, now I got another one in LA and it's just, it's awesome, man. Just to see guys, and I think just to see guys, to see the growth and to yeah. see guys come in and being invested in someone, I think that's not me to not be selfish and not always think, well, how can I help? What, like, what, what do I need today? It's like, oh, what is, what's so-and-so? What, what shit's he going through? And when you're in those meetings, dude, like everybody like leaning in and like honestly gives a shit about what you said. And they give a shit about what you say and how you're feeling with a nod. And like, we always go like this, like when we agree with you, like mm -hmm. do this. And it's not a like on an Instagram post. It's not a view. You know what I mean? It's, it's like actual human connection. And we never give advice, but it's like, it, it would be like, you know, Vincent, when you said that, that resonated with me. Like, you know, when you said this, like, I really felt that because whatever reason. Sure. But it was like that real connection of, oh man, like not only is someone like, oh, like I, I get you. It's like, no, 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 you, you, you listen to listen. You didn't listen to respond. Yeah. You just listen to listen and did not give advice. And then just let me have my space. Yeah, that's the hard part, of, especially as men, we think that we have to be uh, fixers, right? We need to like always kind of tinker and fix things. And that's one thing I definitely learned my wife was uh, sometimes you just got to sit there and rub their back. <laughs> like, like sometimes like when she's in her space, man, like I, I used to be like, you know, trying to be like, you know, all right, what are we going to do? We're going to, you know, and then I was like, eventually, like I've gotten to a point, I'm like, that's not what she needs right now. Like, and that's just come with my own growth and development. But, you know, that's not what she needs right now. Like she just needs to sit the fuck down and shut the fuck up put my hand on her back and just let her know I'm here and let her unpack it when she's ready to unpack it, how she wants to unpack it, if she wants to unpack it. But just knowing that there's someone across from you that's like, I'm here, whatever it is, however it is, there's no judgment. There's no, there's, there's no prying. I'm just here. And, and that's sure. it. And when you see people step into that space, I think that's, it's, it's so, it's so powerful. And I think another part, a big part of it for me is like, this mirror idea, right? Like everyone's like, we, we spoke about a little bit earlier, but everyone's, we're all human, right? And we're all going through something. And when you could see yourself and other people and you could, and, and, and you realize that it's just a mirror, you know, uh, that's when you can step into their shoes and be like, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit here. And, you know, and that's when people really start to, uh, to open up. What, what has, I mean, you went from Philly well, doing, yeah, you get it. Dad, do you have the speakerphone on? Dad. Ma, the meatloaf! Dad's like listening to the messages, but have it like, <laughs> message number three. Yeah. yeah. Like the house one? No, on his cell phone. I'm waiting, oh, okay. I'm waiting for like his old Nextel thing. To be like, <laughs> and he's just yeah. like, bro. Yeah, bro. Hit, yeah. Up, uh, hit up your boy. Um, <laughs> No, no, I was, I was just saying like that transition from East Coast sports reporting, kind of doing, doing, the, doing the thing that you thought you wanted to be doing, then going out to LA, kind of getting into another pocket of, you know, thinking you're doing what you want to be doing and then kind of transitioning into this whole other work where it's like, people are like, what are you, what are you doing? And then you pack up your stuff and then, and then you're living on a boat. What was, what was the transition to living on a boat? How'd that come about? Dude, first of all, I just want to put out there, transitions are fucking hard right like it, it's hard to make a transition and like you know i i want to put out like this i i feel like for me i make a lot of excuses i i've, I've always like made excuses like well I, like 
well, I could have done this, but this or this or this. And like I saw this year and, and I think particularly like transitioning from what I was doing and this ego of like how I thought people saw me to shifting to like, oh, well, if Matt moves home or if, or, or if Matthew isn't acting or isn't doing the things that he said he was supposed to go to LA to do, then he's like a failure. Or, or, and, and I was caught up in what people thought. And then I had this moment, I was like, who gives a fuck? Like, no one cares. The whole world is falling to shit right now. Like, I was so blessed to make the transition into men's work, like when I did, because it, it, this, this 2020 was a ticking time bomb for that. And, and I say that to say, when I moved to LA, my whole thing was, I'm gonna entertainment and I'm gonna do all this stuff. So like, my identity shifted from like sports and like being, being in Philly to shifting to LA and doing this whole thing. Um, uh, so for me, I put all this extra pressure that I had to do the, and I, and I, I did a decent amount of stuff, but like, I guess it's like, when is it ever enough? Yes. You know? And, yes. and for me, I'm able to come to grips where like, Hey, that was an awesome chapter and I'm ready to shift. But that chapter started with when I was driving across LA, I had, my buddy Mike came with me and he actually came across. We did another road trip again this year. Um, got him out of quarantine and we took like a three week road trip across the country and it was incredible. But I hit Mike up and, and uh, my ex and I, we had a conversation and, and we were still living together even though we broke up and it was apparent we weren't going to get together. And I was like, I mean, I can't live in this, this apartment anymore. And I was like, well, tomorrow I'm just going to LA. And I, I sold my car, bought a new car that day. The next morning, my buddy Mike and I drove across the country and um, we just blasted through and we didn't, I didn't really talk for, uh, I didn't really talk for like two days. And it was interesting because we, when we were driving, we stopped in St. Louis and it was pouring in St. Louis and we, uh, we like slept outside, actually outside of Bush stadium There you go. and, um, in the car and it was Sunday morning it was a church. So we go to church and, uh, we're both Catholic and we went in and usually like Catholic services on the East coast. Like if you walk in late, people are like, this guy, this. look at this mother, like, this, walking in late. The priest might call you out. Right? Uh, <laughs> we walked in and it was rainy, we were wet, and they literally like stopped. And most churches, you know, like the, the priest or the pastors up front and everybody sits here, it was like a circular. They literally stopped and were like, here's a coffee. Like, can we dry you off? Like, hey, where are you from? Come sit here. We were like, <laughs> right. this, is, this is what this should be. And the priest was literally like, I'm not from here. Um, I literally just randomly came in last night and um, I just knocked on the church's door. They like let me in and I, I'm staying here. And he's like, you know what? I'm just kind of adrift right now. And he's like, if anybody's like just here and they're just kind of drifting and they're trying to figure out like what, what the next step is. Um, and he goes into this whole sermon and Mike, and Mike literally goes, holy shit. <laughs> stop and, look at him. and I was like, it literally, it was like what you said with like the serendipity of men's work. It sure. was like that message could not have been more time by a guy who like you'd think like a priest in the 60s. Like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. Like he has his life pretty much set up. And sure. he's like, I don't know. And it was so powerful. And um, we just got in a car and, and we just like sat and we drove all through Kansas and we didn't speak. And Mike and I were just sitting there and I was just like, I was like blown away by this. We hit the Rockies and Mike's like, so we haven't really talked in like three days. Um, Hold on, you're getting, rob you're, you're getting robotic and we're getting to the height of the story. Hold on, go ahead. So you got to the Rockies. Like we hit the Rockies and Mike's like, you know, we, we haven't really talked three days. Uh, where are we going? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I have to be honest with you. I have no idea what we're doing. And uh, I was like, you just go on like Craigslist and just like try to figure out something. And I, I don't know. So we found a spot that said bachelor pad in Marina Del Rey. And I didn't know what Marina Del Rey was. I like looked, it, it was on the water near Venice. And I'm like, all right, bachelor pad. It was like in my range. So like we get there and I had some like, I had like a check and some cash in my pocket. I, I, I did a little work in New York before I left, which was also a godsend how I booked that. Um, and we meet this guy, Eddie, and it's kind of like, Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Like, like very, like he, he's type very, type. he's very Eddie-ish. Oh, he's he's. You think of Eddie? He's Eddie. Right? He, he's Eddie. <laughs> he's the fast Eddie. So I get there to meet him, and he like starts walking down to like the docks, and I'm like, I don't know. If this, I was like, maybe this guy's like got to get something off a boat or something. And we get this boat. He's like, all right, here she is. I was like, oh, it's it's a boat. 
And he's like, yeah. And I was like, oh. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah, I got to live on this thing. Like, this is like the dream. So I, I like moved do on you know how, Do you know how to use a boat? I had no idea what the hell I'm doing. Dude. And, but, but here's the thing. That was a power boat. I was on that boat for like three months. And this is for everybody who wants to hit rock bottom. I was on that boat for three months. And uh, I was looking to kind of buy a boat because I was thinking like what I would, what I'm paying for rent on this boat. Like if I sunk that in over a year or two. No pun I, intended. I could just, yeah, seriously. <laughs> seriously. I could just buy a boat. So I was kind of looking for a boat nonchalantly, whatever. But, and it was 4th of July weekend and had this director flying out and he was going to stay. And I was like, oh, I live on a boat. You should come out. Like, it's like July 3rd. Eddie calls me, get the fuck off the boat. I'm like, what? He's like, a guy just bought it. He wants it for the weekend. You got to get your shit off. I'm like, what? I'm like, dude, I got somebody coming. He's like, I don't care. Get off. He's like, I'll be over in an hour. I'll give you your money back from, from yesterday. Cause like I gave him the rent. Yeah. And he's like, and, uh, we're getting out of here. I'm like, dude. So like, I'm like getting my stuff. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I got a call. I was supposed to, I thought I had this commercial booked in Hawaii. They called me. Uh, I didn't book it because I got a haircut right before the second. I was ready for the final callback. And the lady like shaved my head essentially. So like, they're like, unfortunately your hair is too short now. We can't book you. We had to go with the other person. And I'm like, mother of God. Then somebody sends me a text as I'm throwing my shit in, in the car. Somebody sends me a text and it's the girl that I left LA or Philly to go to LA with. And she's with some dude in this picture. And I'm like, and we were trying to like, I thought we were working it out. And I'm sure. like, my God, I like get in the car and I'm driving on the four or five. And I'm like on the phone with my dad. I'm like, dad, I'm like, I'm about to break down. Right. I'm like, dad, I don't know what the fuck to do. Why am I here? I don't know what I'm doing. I like, I'm praying every night. My dad said, just keep praying. I'm like, I, I don't think God's hearing me. All of a sudden, boom, I get hit in the back, slam on the brakes, rear end the shit out of this Prius. My car's up in smoke. I get out. It, the whole front of my car is destroyed. I'm like, dad, I'll call you back. I like, I like look around and I'm like, there's no way. The, the, shit's supposed to happen in three. Hold minutes. on. You're, you're getting robotic again on me. Can you hear me? Yeah, hold on. Go ahead. So you got hit. Uh, no, nah, still robot. So you got hit by the, you, you're, you got hit. I hit I, and I rear end this car. I'm like rock bottom. I see an 18 wheeler. I'm like, I could step in front of this thing right now. <laughs> Who would know? Who would notice? Who would care? And in that moment, I just was like, you know what? Like, maybe I got to regroup. Maybe I got to figure out what the purpose of being out here is and, and what my thing is. Cause I'm just kind of floating right now. And you know, I, I, I got in that car and I drove that, that fucking thing back to my cousins and it's smoking all over. My cousin comes outside and he's just, just like, goes back in, he comes out with a six pack, <laughs> just crash one. And he's like, just leave the key in the car. Hopefully someone steals it. All right. Let's just, let's have a couple of beers. And honestly, no shit. I got a check from the insurance company. I was looking at this boat earlier before, before that boat and somebody like bought it. So then I was just like, whatever. The guy calls me and was like, Hey, that boat's back up for sale. The same amount of money that I got for my wreck. And I was like, all right, let me come check it out. So I meet up this dude, we go and, and it's this awesome old sailboat. I meet up with him at night. I have no idea what I'm doing. I can't see shit. I'm literally like knocking on it. I'm like, oh, it sounds sturdy. I'm like, does the radio work? He's like, yeah, radio works guy. No idea what I was doing. And, and I bought this boat because of like the allure of it. It was it's a 1966 Columbia. It's like super like masculine inside it. Like that kind of has, it smells like the sea. Its name was Della Brown. Yeah. Um, yeah. You got cur like you're curling up your mustache. You got the pipe going. Dude, it, 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 it was so awesome. And when I got in it, I was like, exactly. You're just, like, a, I, you're just a fucking it, sea captain. Exactly. When I got in it, I was like, this just feels right. And this is the place. This is like my fortress of solitude. That's I'm on awesome. The water, I'm outside of the city. This just feels good. So uh, there's another story by there's a story on YouTube about like the misadventures of the boat and buying the boat and understanding, you know, the parts of a boat when you get a boat. But anyway, I got this boat. Technically, it could have been an epic disaster because I was a moron, but it all ended up working out. But 
I had this sailboat and it was awesome. And I learned to sail on it. And I had no idea what I was doing, by the way. Like, I didn't know shit. And even that night, the guy's like, you want to take it out? I was like, oh, no, I don't have an insurance yet. If something happens, I don't want to be liable. Really, I'm like, I, I hope. I don't even fucking ride a boat. I mean, yeah, exactly. But that's, no, like, that's kind of like the best way to learn things, though. You know what I learned? When I was in the marina, there's two types of dudes that are in the marina. It's the old sailor, like the old Navy guy who just wants to teach you everything. And then it's the loaded guy who got divorced and his wife took everything and he kept the boat. Those are the two guys. And each one of them want to want to show you how to, why you're doing things wrong and, or want to take you on their boat. So I was just like, all right, like, like, I don't know what I'm doing. So you can, you can work away and you could take me out on your boat. So. I mean, that's, I, I, I was my, LA. So yeah. I was very blessed. I had a very unique experience. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of the best way to learn things is like throw yourself in these very uncomfortable positions, these very uncomfortable circumstances cool. and, and learn. And, you know, it goes back to the serendipities, but things happen for you, not to you. Right. It's, it's a reframing, right? It's, it's a perspective. I, I'm a huge believer in that because I feel like, especially this year, like if, if you start thinking things are happening against me and not for me, it's like, it's like having a gratitude journal or just being in gratitude. It's like when you hit that rabbit hole and it like right now, you start looking at like everything behind the virus and what's going on and the vaccines and all this stuff. And you could, you could just like totally lose yourself instead of stepping away and being like, well, I'm healthy. I can call my parents. I can still fly. I can still do all these things. Like there's a lot of blessings here. And, and I think what you just said, like things are happening for me and not against me when when you shift that i'm a firm believer in like your mindset like wherever you have in your mind that's the reality that you yeah. create and i don't mean you manifest i want a huge house i want all this stuff but this idea that like if i shift from being negative to thinking well what's the good of this situation it's so fast how you how the outlook shifts on on how i see things and what used to look so bad only 20 seconds ago with a couple breaths and just like, all right, man, and just shift. Dude, it's so amazing. And, and I struggle with that a lot. And for me, that's where like my men's groups help. That's where I'm in this adventures club in LA. That's where like my church community, um, those are all things that ground me and that, that keep me humble in like, dude, like the world isn't against you because realistically the world doesn't give it. It's not like the world is sitting here. Like, how can we make Matthew's day horrible? Like, yeah, but but we operate, yeah. but, but we operate that way. And if we stay in yeah. that headspace, if we stay in that headspace, we can let that spiral completely out of control. And then we do catch ourselves in these rabbit holes that we can't dig our way out of, right? And we get stuck in this in this mindset, this victim mindset. The victim mindset, and even me just talking about that, I feel like tense in here. I feel my face is flush. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm just hypothetically speaking about a situation, but I think that's a, it's, it's also a great thing is like this, this victim mindset and, and being able for me to understand the triggers of that, like the physically, yes. like when I start getting in this mode or when I start getting angry, I like, it was saying what you were saying earlier, like guys come in a group and their shoulders are tense. And like, I feel like tense up, I can see my brow and like, I can feel like I'm starting to get red. And like, when I start to notice these things, I'm like, all right, well, I do that when I get angry. Why am I angry? Is it worth my energy? Like, is this going to help a situation? All right, calm down. Like, you're good. You're in LA. It's 70 degrees. It's 25 degrees back home. Right. Like, let's just start with that. <laughs> I think a big part of that is the reverse engineering of, 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 of the emotions, right? Like taking it, you know, I always, I always have the perspective of like, like almost like bullet, like the matrix, your emotions and like taking it and like taking out and extrapolating like the, the root of it, not just looking at like, I'm frustrated right now. Like that's one thing is to, is to say it and speak it out loud and, and, and recognize that. But now it's like, well, what's the cause? What was the trigger? Why is that sure. the trigger? And, and how can I recognize this trigger that much earlier? You know, and I try to teach that to my daughter. She's five and she's had a couple instances where, you know, she's getting like, nah, and I'm like, and we have like a little code word. It's like a Barbie shoe laptop, the shoe laptop, because she had an incident with a Barbie shoe. She was trying to stand up and she was trying to stand up and kept on falling. And she's like getting so mad. I'm like, step away from the Barbie shoe because your energy towards the Barbie shoe is all fucked up. Take a deep yeah. breath. And I promise you, 
I, I was, I was, take, I was, I was hail marrying this one. I was like, I promise you, the Barbie shoe will stand up. And she like sat back. She was like three and a half, four maybe. And she's like, yeah. and she like put the Barbie shoe down and it stood up. And I was like, yes. I was like, good thing that I panned out. But, but, but it's about the energy you're putting towards this, this, this moment, right? And if you're able to reverse engineer it, extrapolate, like you said, get the good out of it. Turn the stone over and look at the other side of it because there's always something else to it. But we get caught on this, this, yeah. this treadmill of thought and then we're down this rabbit hole and then we're going to see doctors and we're getting prescriptions and we're drinking and we're doing this and we're fucking around and it, it just becomes a disaster. You know, I, I totally agree. And I think that in, for me, it's like, like I create a lot of content for, for clients and it's like even making content like I used to be happy, like I make a video, I used to be happy because it'd be like a movie that's coming out. So you can anticipate it. But now everything is like, I make something to go out for people to see it for maybe an hour and then it disappears. And there's like no joy in creating things or the, the I, slowing down to enjoy your work, um, like as a creative. So I feel like what really helped me and well, two things. One, I think it's going, going home. Like when I'm home, I see the temper my dad has. I see how my brothers act. I see these things and I notice, I don't like that. And I'm like, oh shit, I do that. Ah, yeah. damn, I do do that. Yeah. And then once, once I'm with people that like I love, but I know like I'm a part of them and I see these things, I'm like, all right. Guilty. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. I also think the cool thing is, is growing up, my, my one brother and I were always sports. Everything was sports. So my dad be like, he restored cars and he'd be restoring a car and he'd be like, Matthew, can you hand me something? And like the jack would fall, get crushed because we threw a football and somebody missed it and he hits it and it falls on. Like right. that was us. But my other brother was always right there with my dad, like helping him out. And I envy that now as I get older, I'm like, man, I wish I would have learned how to build houses. Like my dad, like this fireplace, my dad did this when he was like early twenties. Um, I wish I learned how to work with my hands because I feel like there's such, there's a beauty and there's like something to, especially men, to work with something like that. And that really helped me slow down. So getting the boat, it's older, so shit breaks. That's like a boat, break off another thousand. That's what boat stands for. Yeah. Um, but learning how to do things on my own, and I had no idea what to do, but like going to the library and getting a book out and being like, all right, this is how the wire goes. This is what this stuff does. And when I would get angry and frustrated and it's hot out, I couldn't get shit done. But it was a moment I was like, take a deep breath, go have a beer, come back and then do it. It's like what you said, then I can slow down and then I can get the thing done. And I got this old motorcycle I've been working on and it's the same thing. If I try to rush things or if I'm pissed off or whatever, like I can't get it done. I got to like step back and look at the whole situation and then come back to it and then work on it. And I think there's a beauty there um, to, like you said, like, like flipping the stone over, just like to be focused on something physical and something tangible and to see yourself building something. And, and that may, it could be metaphorically too, like even the men's groups. Like when I first started men's groups, I don't know about you, but like I was scared shit. It's like, oh, who, wants, who the hell wants to hear me? Like, what do I have to say? How, how am I going to hold space? But now when I get on these calls and just boxes all over, you know, it's like, oh my God, I didn't even have to do it. I thought this was all about me doing something because my life was such a show for so long. I don't have to do anything. Just hold that space for men and just let it, let, let humans be humans and let them just talk yeah. and let them get their shit up and, and let's care about each other and generally be interested in somebody that isn't Matthew native. And, yeah. and like when I can do that, I'm like, dude, this is, this is what life is about. I'm on that phone or doing whatever I'm doing. And granted, there's a lot of great things that can happen for that. And social has a lot of good things about it. But if you can't monitor that and have that balance on anything in life, like you lose yourself, like literally you'll lose yourself because you don't see what's going on around you, whether it's your relationships, whether it's your health, um, whether it's your work, whatever it is, shit just passes you by. Yeah, my experience, my first experience with the men's group, uh, I was I was at then at my full time job, and um, 
and I was pulling up to Starbucks or I had coffee. We we're doing it that night. We we're meeting at like some old Elks Lounge type place. It was like the spot you want, you know, it's where you want to do it. It was like an old veterans place. And uh, I'm pulling up to Starbucks and, you know, the voice comes on and it's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't facilitate a men's group. Who the fuck are you? Get your coffee, go back to work, come up with some excuse, text every, I had like 11 guys coming, text everyone, tell them it's off and I shut the here, guys. fuck up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had massive diarrhea. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it. And, and, and oh. it's off. And, and I, like, I was, I literally checked that voice and I, I literally said to myself in my car, I parked and I was like, okay, I see you. I see you ego. I see you fear. I see where you're coming from. You're trying to protect me. You're trying to keep me comfortable and safe. And I thank you for that. But you don't serve me anymore. Like that doesn't serve me. Right. And now that, that I've been doing it almost for a year now, and it's it's like, and there's times where I'm like, you know, it's Thursday night, eight thirty, and you know the kids are in bed. And meanwhile, I'm like, I go to the men's group, and like, you know, I I, I drudge through it a little bit. And I I get in here, and I you know I get I I, I light the you know the 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 Palo Santo, and I clear the space in here a little bit, and I get into my own little space. And then once we're going, it's like, oh yeah, like that's why I do it. Like, it's not about me yet. It is like, it's, it's, it's this weird thing. Like you have to keep yourself in check because you can get very caught up in the egoic aspect of doing something like that. I, you know what? And, and I think it's that voice, right? And like, yeah, part of it is to protect us, but like sometimes you just gotta be like, nah, I'm good, yeah. bro. And you got to yeah. push through that because that's that, that's an, that uncomfortable. And it's like, once you just push through that, that little thing, like once you stepped into that men's group, we're here. I right. can't turn back now. I can't just, well, bye. And just shut the thing. Like y you're here. Uh, so I think that that's so awesome. Just like showing up. And I think a lot of the stuff with like men's group where guys are just like, or anything, right. It's just like, you're so scared. Just, just show up. Yeah. It's like Just the like gym. It's like it's 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 any practice. It's any discipline that you want to implement into your life. It's it really is about showing up and doing the work, and then the rest kind of falls into place. And it may not move at the the pace or the course that you anticipate or you want or you or you expect. Um, but as long as you're showing up every doing every day and doing those micro things, it it, it eventually paints the bigger picture. Uh, and that I think it's leaning into those micro things. Dude, I. You know, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that that's so many things it's like right now for, for men or women or anybody, it's just like, you know, I want to start a job or I want to start a family or I want to like really lean into a relationship or want to buy a home. It's all these things that seem like these huge life moves, or even if it's not a life move, like I want to learn Spanish, whatever, but like, or I want to join a men's group, but it's Thursday. I'd rather drink a couple of beers and watch the game. Like, I don't know. It's just, show, just taking that first step. And honestly, this just reminded me of it. Uh, the first acting thing I ever auditioned for was for, uh, it was for uh, an M. Night Shyamalan movie, and they wanted like karate experts. I took karate when I was like eight years old for like six <laughs> months, I was like too heavy, and the, the guy's like, you can't even touch your knees, buddy. Like, you, kid, your kid's got to drop some weight. <laughs> like, maybe he could be something. You showed, up at, you showed up at Cobra Kai and they were just fucking pepping you with insults? They're like, now nah, nah, you're good, bro. Uh, <laughs> I think I had like my Ninja Turtle stash on me. Um, so like, like Leonardo, I, calm down. Yeah, yeah, take it easy, Donatello. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so I, I remember going on YouTube. And YouTube just came out. It's like 2007, 2008, and I'm like watching like just karate. I don't even know what the hell I'm looking for. Just like I'm like, I guess like you grab a guy's hand or whatever, and they're like, we want to see a two minute sequence. And I'm like, I don't, know I don't know. So I go to this audition and I'm like all nervous and guys are in there, man. And I mean, I'm wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt. These guys got the full gi on everything and they're doing backflips and they're breaking boards and they're like full out. And I'm just like looking around and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And I remember calling my mom, call my mom. I'm yeah, like, why wouldn't you? Of course you call mom. I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm an idiot. And she's like, well, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. So I get up. And right when I get up, this kid like bumps into me and sits down. He's got this bag and he puts his bag down. And the kid's like hunched over and he like opens up his bag and he pulls out this headband. And he just like, <laughs> <laughs> John Rambo's it? Rambo. And he's like, 
duh. And I look and the kid has Down syndrome. Oh man. And I'm like, this kid has Down syndrome. Wow. Most of the world look at this kid and think whatever they're gonna think, but sure. primarily he's not gonna get a movie role, right? Sure. And I'm like, look at the confidence that this kid has. Doesn't give a shit about what anybody else says or yeah. what anybody else thinks. This kid's showing up, he's ready to rock and roll. And I'm like, I'm from Philly, like we have Rocky. How dare <laughs> I not do this audition? And I remember looking at that kid, I never got his name or anything. And I just remember being like, do this. Like that yeah. voice inside my head was like, get out of here, you're gonna embarrass yourself. And I'm like, oh fuck it, whatever, who cares? And literally I went and I went right after this kid and I just remember throwing some kicks and I, I did a kick and I think I pulled something and before I could react, the guy's like, yeah, you're good, next. I was like, that's it? And they're like, hey, can you sign this? Yeah, we'll see you on uh, Friday. And I was like, all right. Wow. And it was so funny because that started like a 10 year career in entertainment. And I met and I've done so many amazing things. I wouldn't be in LA if that wasn't for that kid. Holy shit, I would not be in LA I would have wow. never joined a men's group. I would never be on this podcast if it wasn't for that kid. Wow. Your story. I just realized that right now. That's beautiful, uh, man. That kid, that kid literally changed the course of my entire life. Seeing that kid Rambo it up. Wow. But to, but to just show up. And once you're there, who cares? And that was my ego. And I was so worried what other people thought or what. I'm like, they don't care about me. Like, they don't care about me. Like. Dude, the ego, it, it's a funny thing, man, because I, it, early in quarantine, even before quarantine, I started doing like uh, yoga in the morning before like my family would get up at like 4.30 and wake up and just do yoga. And 4:30? yeah, 4.30. And I get on the mat and I'm by, and I mind you, I'm by myself in my living room and I'm doing yoga in my living room. And, and again, it's like, what are you doing? Like the girls, she's a perfect L. Like her legs are straight. Like she's just like, and now raise your legs. And my legs are like, the, I'm, yeah, dude, I'm shaking. Like I'm like, oh, fuck. like, I'm convulsing on the floor. Like my hamstrings are tight. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're embarrassing yourself. And I literally said to myself, in front of who? You're in your fucking living room and your family's sleeping. But just that own stepping yeah. into that discomfort can be so jarring and really can it could set you on a 10-year career and put you on a completely different trajectory or you could have left that room and you could have listened to that voice and you would have had a completely different story yeah dude it's uh you know what and, and i love philadelphia and um you know but i i think for me being, I'm from a small town outside of Philly and, and you get caught up in Philly and Philly is a great place to just feel comfortable and just to sure. stay. There. So um, for me, it was that helped project, that, that projectiled me into this space where like I was forced to leave Philly and to travel and go to New York and go to LA and do all these things and be able to see the world. And, and um, I think just having that perspective of being able to, uh, I think also just to meet people, right? Like if you're only in your own circle and if you're always in that, you create your identity based off of those people. Sure. Compared to like travel or compared to like shifting and, and being all over, like you, know, you step into a new country, no one knows who you are. You step in a new city, no one knows who you are. I'm not saying re you can reinvent yourself, but you can let go of some of that shit that you said earlier that isn't serving. You. Like who is the real you? And how can I let go of all that facade and all that bullshit? I mean, even I'm guilty on here with Instagram and stuff. And how do I let go of that? And then how do I, how do I just show up into a new experience and be like, cool, let, like, let's just see what happens. Like, just, we're so blessed to be in America. We're so blessed oh, yeah, it's wild. to be alive at this time, not COVID time, but I mean, just this time in general to be able to do anything, anything, the internet, everything like you could, you could, it's so incredible. And like, I take it for granted so much. And it's like, how dare I? I'll yeah, and it's I saw this meme early, like pretty early on in quarantine. It was like if you're still, if you're still in the same place you were pre-COVID or whatever, is like you're you're. It was like what did it say? It was like if if you're still in the same place you were pre-COVID, then your excuse was never time. Like it was it was never time that was against you, and that was like always my thing. I was like, oh, time, time. You know, I I I would. I'm luckily I found a lot of discipline early in the morning and, and after doing more of my research into why that 
lined up so perfectly for me like there's there's you know philosophical reasons there's you know religious reasons there's there's cosmic reasons why the the early morning lends itself well to being the most creative and it worked for me and i kind of stumbled into that discovery but you know i I always had time and and, you know married two kids you know time 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 and then when quarantine kind of came about i was kind of in a situation i was like okay well now what the fuck am i gonna do like let's see what you're made of bro like you 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 wanted time here it is motherfucker now do something with it and um you know i got my certification life coaching and i and and i'm doing more with the podcast than i've ever done before and i'm leaning into that space more but i think that we can again it goes back to the previous point we can get caught up in the other the other trajectory of life or the other mindset the other neurological pathway that we've that we've calcified over years and that becomes comforting. And it goes to your point of like, yeah, Philly's great. It's home. It's comforting. And it serves me when I'm back here and I see the family and all that stuff. But it serves me when I'm here. And, and then I have to leave here and go back to serving in a different way. Sure, man. I can, like, I mean, you can always, like, just case in point, my brother and I were in Australia or we were in New Zealand and left New Zealand to go to Philly to watch Super Bowl 52 and be in Philly when the Eagles beat the Patriots and we could riot. Like, we can always go back. And like, Philly will always be a part of me no matter what. Like, just always. But at the same time, it's like, dude, you, you, sometimes you gotta let go of that favorite t-shirt or sometimes you gotta <laughs> let go, of, you know, you know what I mean? Like of yeah. something that, that isn't serving you and it's keeping you here when you know your potential is just limitless. Literally all of our potential is limitless. And I have a couple of brothers and sisters that are in high school. And I tell them that all the time. I'm like, they're so addicted to like their phones and like they, they don't go out and they don't do things. And I know right now it's tough and they can't go to school, but like zero social like interaction. I'm like, you guys have no idea how valuable life is. And it pains me to see you all every day on your phones. And it pains me just to see this. And you're not outside getting dirty. And you're not like running in the creek and you're not doing like riding your bike and doing these things and it's like i see the world shifting and like i don't like that i don't like where it's going and i think for me working in this space it's been very difficult for me to like see that and then how do i not try to control what that is but how do i like adjust Hold on, my you mindset. You got super alien there. Like, how do I adjust my mindset? And how do I adjust? Like, I think a big thing for me is like, I get riled up, like in a situation, like I'll let something like, um, like really affect me. And sometimes it's just like, just leave, just step out of that situation. Or like, yeah. if you don't like something, just let it go. If I don't like what I'm watching, put the phone down. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Easy to do. And for my little brothers and sisters, I realized like, sometimes it's like, I'm always like, just get off your phone instead of being like, Hey, put the phone down. Let's go. We're going to go drive somewhere. Or you know what? I got a couple of mods. Let's go. And it's the moment that I've had some awesome breakthroughs. My little brother, who's he's adopted, he's 15. And like, I've had some awesome breakthroughs with him where it's literally like, let me just know that I see you. Yes. And I see that you're a human being. And what are you going? You got to go through some shit, man, being 15 and like adopted and he's black. And I'm like, you're going through like this stuff. And like, you know, like just the world in general and you're hitting puberty, but you can't be with girls. And like, you know, it's like, what's going on, man? Like I do this practice with my little brother it's, and I don't even know how it came or whatever. I just, I saw that like, I, I can see when a guy's struggling. Right? Mm-hmm. Like you see when, when somebody's about to break and we do this thing every night that we just go in front of the mirror and we just say, look at ourselves in the mirror and we just go, I love you. Beautiful. Look in the mirror and you just say, I love you to yourself. And, I, and, and at first he couldn't do it. Couldn't look at himself. He's like, well, why? I'm like, do you love yourself? He's like, well, why? And I'm like, just do it. And then I was like, all right, now why do you love yourself? And he couldn't. He's like, I don't. And he just started crying. Wow. And I was just like, fuck. And then I just was like. I love you because of blah, 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 blah. And I just rip, I just rattle this stuff off. And I'm like, man, like we're, we're with, it's what I was saying before, just cause you're not alone doesn't mean you're not alone. 
and sometimes it's just it's just seeing the value in yourself and i feel like insta or, or social media and like the phone like you're always comparing yourself to somebody and you're always comparing yourself to everybody else and we're in this culture where it's everything's comparing and it's like dude just what about just like man i love i i'm, I'm so proud to be me and i love who i am and how i move um and it was super powerful to be able to do that with him. And now, like, whenever I see him, I'm like, do you say you love yourself? And he's like, Meh. I'm like, let's go. And we go upstairs and we do it. And then we'll, like, say a prayer. And then, like, and it's funny, too, because it's, like, I have my judgments, like, God, ah, he's, he's 15. And, like, and then, like, I'm just like, what are you grateful for? And he just rattles off this awesome stuff. And then he goes and he just, like, goes into, like, a prayer or whatever. And I'm just like, damn. Like, the one day I just started crying. That's awesome. And I was like, I, it pains me that I put judgment on you and I would give you shit and I, you, you don't feel seen on here and you didn't even feel seen from me. Yeah. And like, how shitty was that of me? Yeah. And it was just, the, it's like beautiful just to connect and, and to show him, dude, you can be 16 and cry, man. I'm 35 and I cry, man. Yeah. But that's, but that's how you do, that's how you do shift that, right? That's how we do change the way we move through the world and where we're headed as a culture. You know, I, I started, you know, I read the book by Sean Shapiro, uh, good morning. I love you. And she would start mm -hmm. every morning and she would, she would struggle with just saying, good morning. I love you. Like just saying that to herself. Like, and, and I was like, let me, let me start that practice. Let me try it. And I do my Wim Hof breathing. And after Wim Hof's breath, you know, I do my yoga, then my Wim Hof breathing, then I meditate, and then I, then I go through my ritual with that. And, you know, I, I get my blessings from each one, like whether it be the yoga I'm listening to, and they say, go ahead and namaste. And Wim yeah. Hof is like all the love, all the power, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I get all my blessings. And then, and, then I, and then when I'm done, I sit up and I just stop and say, good morning, I love you. And it's hard to say that to yourself, like, and, and step into that. And I think a huge part of that is being seen, right? Like it, 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 it's hard to be seen. It's hard to, you know, see others and, and how you kind of meddle your way through life. And, you know, that's how we do change a culture. You know, it's, it's something I, I do with my daughter. We, we, you know, at the end of the night, we're pretty diligent with a gratitude practice. And it awesome. started, and, I, and I, you know, I've told this before, but it started with like Barbies and ice cream. And now it, it just, it's now it's down to like, great days and her brother and her parents and you know you know uh, she wants to donate one one toy to a boy and one toy to a girl for christmas and and that's how we change a culture that's how you know doing things like that seeing a 15 year old and saying hey man like whether it be your brother or someone hey man like let's do this you know what i mean and showing it's okay to be seen and to be vulnerable and and to be a man doesn't mean that you have to you know show up in a certain light and 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 not step into a whole different space. Uh, you know what? I, I love that you're doing that. And like, that is what changes things. And I think it's especially important with like fathers and their daughters and to show up and show like, this is what a good male role model looks like. And this is like what a good man looks like. And I think it's interesting too. Like, you know, I, I bring up sometimes like when we do groups or do coaching stuff, it's like, what is a man? Like everybody says man up or like do man shit. But like, it's so crazy. The first time I said that, like it was like 25 guys, everybody said something different. Yeah. And then it was like, well, who, who did you learn to be a man from? And like everybody's story was different. And some guys yeah. were raised by their grandmothers or their moms or their dad was there, but wasn't there. Or, you know, they were abusive or they were great or what, and it was, or their grandfather. And it was just like this, like, I'm like, wow, like we don't even know what the hell they're saying or yeah. what it means. And we're having the conversation. Well, I think the other part of it, we're throwing around the term, which is even more dangerous because, you know, yeah. we're not, we're not having the conversation. We're not, we're not teaching people or men in this case, we're not teaching them how to show up, what it even means. And that's something that I, like, I, I really, I, I, I admire about different cultures is their their admiration towards elders and that's something that we have gotten so far away from you know getting out of tribe mentalities but we don't have that elder that you can go to with the problem and they say you know but that's that's 
that's the thing, right? Right. That's how we shift a, a culture is, is creating those elders, becoming those elders and, and, and creating those relationships and, and shifting and, and, and guiding, not giving answers, but allow, you know, it's the alchemist, man. You know, it, it's invoking in what people, what they already know about themselves and letting them come to their own conclusions through self-discovery and, and, and their own journey. But we've we've lost that man. That's something that I I really I hope that one day like and thank you for the comp. But that you know that's something I want to give to my daughter. And I say to her like you can come to me and tell me anything in the world, anything in the world. We we better you know you better come correct with it. You know what I mean like don't take advantage of that. But you can come to me about anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, she's five. Thank God right now the you know the things that she's you know walking away from her Zoom class are the big problems. Um, but she's five and I get that. I understand that. And, you know, sometimes I have to put on the, the dad suit and be like, you can't do that, you know? Um, but there's always a, there's always a Danny Tanner moment at the end of the night. I love a good Danny Tanner moment. Gotta have a good uh, Danny Tanner moment. I also think that's the problem. TV, does, they don't have morals at the end of shows anymore. Uh, you don't. But I, I think that the, I'm in this, this club called the Adventure Club of Los Angeles. And these guys are like, the most average age, probably like 70, but the most well-traveled, like smartest, sophisticated, like dude you ever met. Like, yeah. like we have World War II guys. We have Vietnam guys. We have guys that have been on the moon. We have guys that have been in the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Our one guy right now is running. He's the whole head of the South Pole Station. Like dudes are everywhere and have done everything. And what a great place for me to shut my mouth and just listen. Like, I don't even have to tell my story. I don't have to, I just, it's so much wealth of knowledge and experience in that. Like you get yourself a, a, a nice scotch and I just listen. And one of the guys in there is like an Ernest Hemingway, one of my good buddies. Um, and I call him my Hemingway because this guy like rattles off poetry, always pulls out a good cigar, always has a good bottle of something with him, always has a fantastic story. It's like so well read, always has a story about Teddy Roosevelt or Winston Churchill and like, this is like, this is like where, when men stood up for what they believe. And this is like, where like, and it just, it's just like this awesome, like throwback era of bygone men that like, I'm like, dude, if I just saw that guy in the street, I'd probably ignore him. I'm like, I was, yeah. And I'm like, man, like, like, you're so right. We, we, the, the elderly and like that wisdom that they've always held within our community, within our society, like here, it's just like, like even COVID, oh, old people are going to die. Okay, whatever. And it's just like, wow. Like I think Italy, like I've, I love Italy. I've been to Italy so many times and like, I see like how awesome it is to see like an old woman, like making bread in the morning and she's making the fresh mozzarella and like the old guy sitting outside with his wine and playing, you know, uh, he's playing, uh, the accordion or whatever it is. And it's like, imagine if that's just gone. That's like the yeah. essence of what makes that beautiful. Yeah. And it's so sad to me. And I think also like to start that is this idea of like introducing men, like boys into manhood and having this group of men to like lead them and guide them and show them. Like, this is what, this is what it means to be a man for, for us in whatever that capacity is. And we don't have that. Like, uh, think of like Native American tribes, or you think of like, you know, like, um, like a rite of passage. We don't, we don't do that. Like, kids aren't even learning about sex. It's like, oh, I saw some porn. I guess that's what it, like, I, right. there's no conversations of, this is what it means to be a man. These are the virtues. And like, you know what? We're, like my dad was awesome because when we turned 13, he would take us on a trip. Each one of us, he would go, where do you want to go? Somewhere within driving, like five hours driving of like Philly area. And he would take us and we would, we didn't really know like this, the awkward like sex. And we'd just be like. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now what? Right. Um, but it was awesome because my dad was like, you know, a ton of brothers and sisters, but like this weekend's for you. And this is, this is why you're special to me. And it was, beautiful. it was awesome. I was very, very blessed to have that. I'm stealing that from your dad. Dude, you should. It's awesome. Totally am. And, and my mom did it with my sister. So it was. It was I might do it with both my kids. Just take each one. Yeah. They think a, that, that like showing young kids that they're valuable. You're not just a kid. Like 
like we respect you because you are the future and then seeing like the elder and, and being like you have so much wisdom and your life meant something so much and it's like there's a disconnect between both of them and somehow we just ended up here and we don't really know what we're doing yeah yeah i'm totally stealing from your dad and i think and i think you know again it, it's about being seen right and, and things are always out of two two roots right it's the root of fear it's the root of love and it's it's a matter of you know especially being a parent, I can attest, it's very hard to just, you know, not get down, you know, frustration or whatever it is. And, you know, it, it gets very, it, it tests you, man. It tests, it tests you to the umph degree. And I, and, and you know, listen, we all have our moments. Um, but when you can, you know, stop. And I think that's one of the, the, you know, if someone asked me, when did I become a man or if I'm a man or what makes you a man or, you know, the question, I'd say it's when I'm able to, when I was able to, respond to life rather than react to life and that's like a line of demarcation for me when i realize like when i'm interacting with people and i don't just react i can give myself that whatever amount of time that feels like eternity and i could choose my my adventure and my path that i want to go down and i could see it play out in those different ways i think that to me was my line of demarcation of when I stepped into it. Cause I'd be like, uh, if someone's like, oh, like uh, I'm a, I'm a guy. I don't like, I'm a, I'm a dude. Like, I, I don't know what I am. Like, I'm not a man. Like I'm not a man, man. But now it's like, it's not the mortgage. It's not the kids, not the wife. It's not the white picket fence. It's not the, it's not the job. It's when you, for me, it's when I was able to respond to life rather than react to life. That was my, that's my answer. What is something you got? Obviously, I'm sure a ton out of being in that group. But like, what's some one thing that you extracted? One lesson that you you took out of that? Out of out of what? Out of the group you're with with the with the elders. Oh, with the Adventures Club, I think we had this guy Bob Silver. Um, Hold on, wait, you're going alien now, and and it's gonna be like a, it's gonna be a monumental uh, part. Yeah, 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 Hold on, there we go. Wait, let's see. Go ahead, say something. We it can no nope, no nope, no nope, still uh, 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 give it a minute oh now you're really out of whack there we go wait no I think if you talk it out it will like reset I just keep talking it out yeah just keep on talking and yeah. then and then all of a sudden like a it'll rusty be, bike chain if you just it, keep on pedaling it will break right through exactly and, and here we are we've arrived we're right all right cool crystal clear um, we had this we have. Um, we had this guy at the adventure club, Bob Silver, who passed away, I think like two years ago now, but he was like the guy at our club that was living at the time. And um, I only met him once and he came and, and uh, he kind of pretty much introduced surfing to, I think he it was, I want to say it was in World War II, was in the reserves, was in Hawaii, saw like surfing, brought it to Peru, started like the Peru International, then came up to Hawaii, then came up here like in the late, 40s because he's from LA got in that whole surfing scene with like all these guys and um and the first time I met him it was like I, I was on the board and we were just hanging out it was late night and he, he's just sitting in his wheelchair and it was like his last time at the club and we knew he was getting kind of old and he's just ripping off stories left and right he's a good looking dude back in the day and he's like he's like uh he's like you're the you're the, you're the kid on the sailboat huh and I'm like yeah he's like where, where have you taken it and I was like, oh, you know, like up to Malibu and like down to, you know, like San Diego-ish. Did you go to Hawaii yet? And I was like, oh, man, I can't take that boat to Hawaii. He's like, I took a 21-foot boat to Hawaii when I was 16 by myself. I was like, and he literally goes, man up. And just turns around and like scoots off in his wheelchair. And I remember being like, yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily like, you're yeah. a man, you do it. but like the way that I see for these guys, it's like they live a life off the beaten path. Yeah. And I think it's for me, it's like everybody's going this way. That's safe. Go off, go off into the brush, see what happens. And it's like, don't, life is so special. Don't, don't do this. Get off wherever you can take a detour, go do it. Um, and, and I think that that's what I get from these guys. It's like, what's scary and what's the most ridiculous thing? And then realize um, that's your adventure now to take. Yeah. And that's, I, I think that, uh, I think that's what I, what I get from those guys. Yeah. I, I think that's a huge, that's a huge lesson learned. That's, you know, I think that, you know, everything, all the growth and it's, you know, tales all this time 
Uh, every Disney movie is based around it, but all the growth happens in the uh, in the discomfort. All the growth happens when you when you lean into the fear and you and you step into that pathway, rather than the uh, the comfort. Right? You have to. You don't have to, but yeah. that's where uh, that's where you kind of discover yourself. Sure. You know what? And 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 I also think it's that, like, even in men's work, being with every man, like we drop in deep. Like we yeah. get deep, we get to the core. It's like what you said before, like, oh, I'm frustrated. Okay, well, what's behind that frustration? Well, this, and then what's behind that? And what's behind that? And let's get to the core root of this shit. Like, I feel like a lot of stuff in America is just the surface level. Sure, well, it's, it's, it's the leaves, deep. it's the leaves on a branch, not, not the root at all. That, that uncomfortable, when, when it gets uncomfortable, let's drop 10 more layers. And then yep. that's when we're going to have, and, and we're not doing that. But I feel like with every man, we do that and it gets deep and it's awesome and it's emotional and intense. With truth tellers, um, and it was co-founded by my buddy, Sean, he reached out to me about it. He was, his mentality was more like, hey, I want to do something because I see this epidemic where men are lonely and men don't have real authentic relationships. There's it, everything out here is bullshit. These conversations we're having are bullshit. Oh, like, yeah. oh, game or whatever. We're not having real authentic things. And Sean's a pretty successful guy. And I'm assuming it's because he's successful. So people either want something from him or he knows so many CEOs slash like people that like, there's nothing authentic there because everything is like, you're trying to work for this thing. And then when you want to have real relationships, you can't have them because everybody either wants something or it's yeah. like you're trained that they got to be more like employee or whatever it is. Sure. Yeah. And so Sean was kind of like, dude, I, I don't, so I'm so used to the pathway of the every man way. Like this is how we do things. And this is, and he's like, I want that. And then I don't want any of that. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay. I mean, and he's like, I just want a space where guys can talk, but it's like meaningful talk, but like not that talk, but like meaningful, but don't bring that stuff up. And that was it. And I remember being like, well, fucking just do the playbook out. I'm on straight audible here. Omaha, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah. And, uh, and I think for me, that was like super uncomfortable, but it's like what I said, it was my ego that I had to run the group yeah. and that I had to do. And once I just came, came in and just was like, what's up? You know, like fucking what? And I started off like, what does it mean to be a man? Mm. And then from there, it's just, it was just that question. And then an hour and a half went by like nothing. And that was eight months, nine months ago or whatever it was. And now it's like this awesome group with all these guys from like all over coming in. And it's like, I think for me, it was like almost like the Avengers Club, that pathway, like this is my pathway and this is how I know how to do it. And like go off here and just figure out whatever the hell that looks like. And yeah. don't maybe not having an agenda is a good thing. And maybe not having a plan is a good thing. Yeah, it's it's the uh, it's the the ad libbing and the adaptation to what's in front of you. You know, that's something I definitely got from like doing jujitsu. Is is the oh, ability to like think on your feet and and being completely fucking humbled every second of the day. You know, every time you're there, you're humbled in some way, shape, or form. And you know, like again, you know, when I when I was starting the men's group, I was like, how do I even? I don't even know. Like, how do I facilitate this thing? You know, and I picked some people's brains. Mike was gracious enough to to give me some some knowledge on on what he does and what every man does, um, and I was super grateful for that. And I implemented some of it and some of it I did and some of it worked. And then I, and then like now it's like a hybrid of that. And, you know, a lot of guys just like step in and, and they say their piece and then, you know, might be a, you know, I try to keep it respectful of everybody's time, but at the same time, some guys just go off and they do their thing and their tangents or whatever it is. And, you know, for me to curtail that to what I think it needs to be, or it should be this um, would be doing, them all a disservice and, and, and kind of not allowing them the proper amount of space and not hold and holding space for them because I want to hold space and I need to facilitate. And this is my ego. And this, it's not a, like you said, it's not about you. It's not about the, it's about them. And if they need to go on a three, four, five minute rant about, you know, the crumbs and the butter that their wife leaves and it pisses them off then let them go on the rant and talk about the crumbs and the butter. Yeah. You know, I, I totally agree. And it's, it's, it's interesting. That, that you said that and that we're talking about this and I'm part of a, a bunch of different groups, but uh, when, when I think it was in August, my Bible study, the guy that leads my Bible study, I have awesome like guys in my Bible study, They're like super successful guys that are like incredible. 
uh, but they're all, they're all like older. Um, and the guy that leads it is 89. His name is Lloyd old Navy dude did really successful in whatever he did, but he has left this beautiful white beard. He's like, if you see like a Greek statue of like an older Greek guy with like the beard and like the curly, like white hair or whatever, sure. that's Lloyd. He always has like the old, like long John Silver's, like the fisherman, like, like uh, turtleneck, like type sweater. Yeah. 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 And he has a staff. The guy is like, got the pipe. He's, he's I got the pipe. Full circle. The pipe. Oh yeah. He's a pipe boy. Um, <laughs> But like everything I want to be when I'm that age. <laughs> and when we were at me this, both. We, were, we were at this retreat, and there's probably like 15, 20 guys, and guys are late. Um, and I could see that like some guy, it was like during COVID, so some guys were like distance and we were outside. So some guys didn't have a mask, some guys had masks, like and I see he's trying to like navigate like what like some guy's first time coming out and he's trying to like figure this out and like He's like, and he kept going like, well, we were supposed to do this, but now we're off. So we can't do this. And hopefully we can get this in and we can, and I see him just like, and, and like doing men's work. I, I'm like, Lloyd's going to just blow. And he, and something happened and I can see he just stops and he like has his back of age turns and he goes, I've the last three hours, I've been so angry and I've been boiling inside because things aren't going the way that I wanted it to. And guys are showing up late and things aren't working out on time and all this stuff. And he's like, and then I just caught a glimpse of the sun setting and I didn't notice the sunset and we're overlooking, we're on the mountains of Malibu and look where we are. And he's like, the point of this weekend was be still and nothing in here is still. And he's like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take the next two hours and just walk around the grounds here. Notice the butterflies, notice the hummingbirds, feel the breeze, notice that sunset and just take whatever time and whatever speaks to you, speaks to you. I'll see you guys later. And he's like, and that was it. And then we came back and he was like, I let my ego, even at 89, wow. I let my ego get out of control. And he's like, and you know what, in that moment, God just told me, just stop. And then at the end, like at the weekend, it was awesome. At the end of the weekend, we were like, what's the most powerful part? And we were like, those two hours, wow. just to just sit and be outside and be around people. Like, think about it. Like, I'm excited to be around people because I can't like, and it was so awesome. And what a great moment to just be still. And to just take time for you. Cause even during COVID, right? Like it's like, you have all this time, but like, it's like you have time, you're supposed to be getting better at something or you have to do this or you have to start your own business or you have to do this or whatever it is, or you got to watch Tiger King or whatever. And it's like <laughs> right. going down, just be. Yeah. And not even meditate, just whatever happened, just lay in the grass and watch the clouds. Like when's the last time you just laid down and looked up and watched the clouds? Yeah. That's, that's something you definitely get. You lose that. You lose that as, I mean, and luckily, you know, I found a lot of that in being a father is being, you know, reintroduced to having a children's lens on life and, and being, you know, the wonder of life. And, and, you know, I, I told the story again a couple of times, but the first time I took my daughter like outside, you know, when she was a little bit older and she was walking and uh, she saw anything she was like talking fully, but she was like, she saw ants and she looked up at me and she was just like, what the fuck are these things? And I was like, and I'll never, and I still have the stick that she picked up that day. It was just like, I still have, it. it's in her room. And like the wonder, I was like, and I thought about this actually when I'm holding my son, like when he was a little bit younger, I was rocking. I was like, you know, nothing. Like, you know, you know, nothing. Like, you know, so we, 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 you know, we surround ourselves and we get, and indeed by culture and we create these masks and these facades and these egos and we wear them at these different points in our lives. And, you know, even at 89, right. Even at 89, the, the old sea captains like, fuck man, I almost, I almost crashed this boat because of, of my relationship with my ego. Right. It's crazy. You never lose that fucking shit, man. You never lose that. And it's, it's beautiful because you just learn to, you learn to manage it. Yeah. Well, I think that's good too, right? Because it's, it's an unrealistic expectation that sure. you know, I'll get over this or, or I'll be perfect in this or I'll figure it. You're never going to figure shit out. You're yeah. never going to figure it out. 
ever, ever, ever. So it's like not trying to figure it out, but just, man, just, just going along for the ride and being content with that and not trying to control it and just being like, all right, just, just show up and just let's just see what happens. Cause that's show, life. Right? Show up and be grateful. Dude. And we know yes. we, we, nothing is guaranteed. I think yeah. that's one thing. 2020 it's like nothing your your good cushy job nope your bank account nope you know what I mean your health nope your ability to go outside and do anything you want and go see family and hug people or talk or have a beer nope yeah yeah but do you let that be the end of the world or do you go okay how do I shift now yeah how do I pivot how do you how do you uh how do you take what's in front of you and, and, and use it again for you rather than to you? So, I mean, I'm, I'm on this podcast. I don't even have pants on right now. God you bless know you. I mean? No one knows. No one knows. That's it. No. Matt, thank you so much for your time, man. This is incredible. This is awesome. I, I, I want to have you uh, speak in the men's group. So I want to connect with you and have you come yeah, we should, and we should do something. And, um, I'll have you on truth tellers too. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Uh, where can people connect with you? Let's hope it doesn't, uh, alien out or <laughs> during this part, but where can people connect with you? Where can people find your work? Where can people join your groups? Yeah. So, uh, um, Oh, it's alien out. Holy shit. Hold on. Wait, now we got to talk it out. Wait, can you hear just, me? Yeah. Wait, just that, talk. That, just that, fuck, that, say that, the ABCs. Like, I don't know. Wait, here, here's a question I can ask you while I were doing who trims your beard. It looks fantastic. I do. I just trimmed it earlier, fuck. but you know, you know what I did? I did the, you know, when you wake up and it was kind of like pushed, yeah. And I started trimming it before I actually like washed it or got it nice. And then I took a little more off a little more. And next thing I knew it was like a sink full of beard hair. Oh, or they look like, let's be honest when you're yeah, yeah. dude. But it's, it's it no, it back. looks good, man. It, and you keep a longer mustache. Back at you. Yeah. You know what? I, I kind of, I love, I, I want to be that old guy someday with like a pipe and he's just, yeah. He's like, I want you're, people to be like, you guys thinking. I guy thinks a lot. He's a yeah. You want to be a polymath. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I want. It's you and me both. All right, we're clear. Where can people connect with you and, and get all your work? Um, if you want to join the group, it's it's you can go to www.truthtellers and it's truth-tellers.com. Uh, it's on Instagram at truthtellers.co. Um, and if you want to connect with me uh, just via social, I mostly only use Instagram. Um, and it's just at Matthew, two T's, Nadu, N-A-D-U. Um, feel free to drop me a line and and honestly like I'm always looking to collaborate with like whatever kind of stuff bring guys into the men's group and I really want to start building out um, beside with along with truth tellers and see how that works with it or maybe separately but something I want to do like a like a faith-based group of guys um, particularly being in Los Angeles um, I feel like a lot of of men that share that share my faith are really being like suppressed um and and guys like matthew mcconaughey is doing his his podcast around right now with his new book and he's like really speaking out and i'm starting to see like my my church particularly has a, a lot of like a-listers and i see them every week and and now i'm starting to see them speak out that like hey like you know we were told don't talk because you won't book roles and wow. for so long so many of us i think as men in general but like faith aside like we sacrifice sometimes our morals for something that we think that we want or something that we think is the end all be all. And I sure. think this is a great year to realize like, man, like where do I stand in my truth? Um, and that's the whole point of like truth tellers really is men living authentically in the land of bullshit. So um, love to have you connect with me there. Um, we, we meet up Tuesday mornings. We call it no bullshit coffee conversations. And literally we just, we just pick a topic and roll and it's, it's awesome. And, and I would love to jump in with, uh, with your group one night. Too. Yeah, the, the council of dudes for lack of a yeah. better name, but that's what it became. And that's what it is now. So <laughs> all based around the big Lebowski. That's all. Oh, dude, obviously. Are uh, you the Matt, Lebowski? You, you don't look like a Donnie. No, <laughs> no, I'm definitely not a Donnie. I don't know if I'm a Lebowski either. I don't know where I fall in that, uh, in that category. You're definitely not a nihilist. No, no, no. 
Stay in your lane, Donnie. Uh, Matt, thank you so much, man. This was a, a complete privilege. And uh, keep on showing up the way you are, man. Do the work. This will be out after uh, the holiday season. But Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you and your family. All the best. Make sure that uh, – absolutely. And make sure that your dad's dog doesn't get frozen to the concrete. Can you see that? In case you guys didn't see it, put an Instagram story up. My parents' dog, for whatever reason, when it goes to the bathroom, it just, like, sits there for a while. Like it's a dude, like it's, it needs a beer in a magazine. Yeah. <laughs> my, my brother's like, Oh no, not again. And my dad's like, damn it. I'm like, what? He's like, his ass froze to the, to the snow again. <laughs> like he's going to the bathroom, his ass just freezing. I had to go over and they have to like cut his hair with scissors to help get him. It's not a pretty sight. That's all right. It's, the dog's probably just enjoying the, sh like, that's the thing, right? We go to the bathroom, we're rushing out, right? He's just fucking like, you know, I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the shit. Hey, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of dogs rush it. This guy just takes his time. We can yeah, learn gotta, something. Listen, got to got to got to appreciate. It. Matt, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. I look forward to uh, connecting you more. Absolutely. Merry Christmas. Be well. Hey, brother.